All right. Uh, good evening to our viewing audience on Facebook and or YouTube. We greet you and we welcome you to our Bible study, Bible study, Bible study for Wednesday. What's the date? April the 17th, 2024. Uh, it is of the Lord's mercies that we have not been consumed because his compassions do not fail. They're new every morning. Great is our God's faithfulness. And so we're so thankful and grateful that God has allowed us to gather together again to study his word. And I want you to join us tonight in Proverbs chapter 10, Proverbs the 10th chapter. That's where we are uh, tonight. And um, we're going to go through these and we're going to see that 10 uh, introduces us to a new layout, a new methodology that uh, Solomon uses to share the precious truths of God uh, as it relates to living a wise and a righteous life. The verse I chose as our key verse for the night is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. In the New King James Version, it says, when the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. Proverbs 10, 25. So it's saying, basically, that when you live by righteousness and wisdom, God gives you the ability to withstand the storms of life. Now, notice that it didn't, it's kind of like what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, at the end of the Beatitudes and, and Matthew chapter 7, where he talks about those who hear his words and disregard them are like people who build their houses on sand. And, and when the storm comes uh, and the rain descends, that the house falls. And he says, great is the fall of that house. But those who hear God's word and apply it, obey it, then those are like people who build their homes on solid foundation. And when the storm arises and the rain falls, that house is able to withstand the elements and is able to survive and to thrive. This is what I always want to make sure we take note of. Whether the house is built on sand or on a solid foundation, both are exposed to storms. That means whether we're obedient to God's word or whether we reject his word, we're still going to face storms. We're still going to have challenges in our lives. So um, I want to help you to stop asking God, why me? And trying to justify how good we are as to why we should have been exempted or excluded from trouble. Uh, trouble is going to come in your life whether you're saved or not. Uh, you're going to have adversity whether you come to church or you don't. You're going to have trouble whether you got the Holy Spirit or you don't. Uh, we can't control what happens to us. But if we have a solid foundation, we can control how we react when trouble rises in our lives. And those who are obedient to the word of God, while we may not be able to avoid the storm, we can survive the storm because we are rooted and grounded on a solid foundation. That's what Proverbs 10, 25 is relaying to us. And we're going to see how that's uh, expounded and built upon and developed through chapter 10. So um, as I was thinking about how, we're going to how I was going to present this, because I ain't going to lie, this is, this is kind of challenging. Uh, the, uh, ch chapters 10 through 22 are kind of like uh, independent clauses that are just happen to be next to each other, but they're not necessarily related. It's not a narrative. You know, in chapters 1 through 9, I, I could break it up in nice little chunks and say, okay, well, verses 1 through 8 are talking about this, and 9 through 15, are, mm -mm. The, next, the next several weeks is not going to be that, that, that simple because it doesn't, as we'll see, there's no common sub-theme that runs through these chapters, but it's still necessary and useful information. So as I thought about it, and I looked at the whole book of Proverbs, I would assume, I would imagine, that Solomon, the writer of this proverb, didn't write this when he was a young man. I don't think Solomon wrote this as soon as he ascended to the throne of Israel. Some think he was as young as uh, 12 or, or, or 15, somewhere in that age range, when he became king. Um, not to say he wasn't wise, but he hadn't had a whole lot of life experience at that time. So I believe that when 
um, Solomon got older and had gone through some things, experienced some things, had some successes and some failures, some triumphs and some setbacks. That's when he was able to now sit down and reflect over his life and share some of these gems with us. And uh, I, if, if we'll think about it in our own personal lives, if when we get to those final few weeks, months, days of our lives, and we had an opportunity to write down some of the things we've learned over our lives, what would you write? What, what would your book of Proverbs be filled with? What, what wisdom do you have to pass on to the next generation? Now, none of us are Solomon. Uh, Solomon was reputed to be uh, the wisest man that had lived. That ain't us. Solomon was also reputed to be one of the wealthiest men who had ever lived. That sure ain't us. However, we all have our unique story. And we've all had some lessons that we've learned in life either by watching other folk or some painful bruises that we still bear. Do I have any witnesses? Yeah, we, we and, and, and the most painful bruises um, are, are not the ones that are external. It's the ones that are e embedded in our souls. Uh, I know that saying says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't know who wrote that. But I wish I could sit down and talk to him and say, I don't know what kind of acid you were on. But I hope that when you came down off your high, you realize how off that statement is. Because you think about it, some of us been in fights, some of us have fallen and broken bones and had all kind of stuff. We've healed from that. We're good. But when we've had abusive things said to us by people we looked up to, when we've been mistreated, when we've been lied on, when we've been gossiped about, when we've been defamed. We remember that stuff 20, 30, 40 years ago, don't we? And, and when we think about it, sometimes the pain is as fresh as if it had just happened. However, although it was painful, there's still a benefit because we can learn from those things. The real tragedy is not that you were hurt. The tragedy is if we're hurt and we don't use our hurt to help somebody else. And I believe, I believe Solomon was hurt a whole lot. But Solomon wouldn't just sit there and lick his wounds and have a pity party. Solomon said, you know what? The least I can do before I leave this world is write down some of the things God has taught me over my life. And I'm not asking y'all to write a book and, and submit it to be added as the 67th book of the Bible. That's done. Bible's already closed. Publishing is done. However, think about how much more enriched our lives would be if we had something our grandparents wrote, our great-grandparents, our, our parents wrote, especially for their descendants to help them through life. I mean, I mean honest writing. Some things to say, uh, what, if your, what if your grandfather uh, wrote that he suffered from insecurity based on some condition he had? And now that you, when you go through that, you're like, oh, my granddaddy went through this. That's why I'm going through this. But a lot of times we're, we're handicapped, right? We have this stuff we, we're facing and we don't realize that it's generational. We don't realize that it's just not unique to us. Some of the mistakes we made, we could have avoided if somebody would have told us the truth about how that thing would end up. Uh, and so why don't we break that cycle? Why don't we today make a decision it don't have to be 32 chapters long, but it can be, um, if it's a page, if it's front and back, write some lessons down and pass them on to, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your nieces, nephews. Give somebody something in writing. One, one of the things, um, I went to a, a preaching conference years ago, and one of the things the, presenter, the facilitator was telling us was that uh, black preachers uh, lag far behind our counterparts because we don't write for posterity. You know, we preach and, and we share the word and we, may, we write our sermons out, but uh, most books you read about Christianity, about uh, preaching, about religion, are not written by folk who look like us. It's not because we don't have the experience or the ability, we just not taking the time to do it. 
And I, oh, you know what? I may go a little bit further. Some of you all got a book in you that you just haven't written yet. And, and, and I know sometimes you think, who me? I ain't, I ain't Elon Musk. I'm not Oprah. What, 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 would my, what would somebody want to read about me? You'd be surprised. Even if it's three people who are helped. Those three people would have missed out if you haven't taken the time to write down some of the principles that you've learned over your life. Don't let your experiences be in vain. Amen? So chapter 10, as I stated, it starts, this is the beginning of uh, the next uh, 13 chapters that are these kind of loosely associated wisdom teachings that we're going to see. It goes all the way through chapter 22, verse 16. And then in uh, chapter 22, verse 17 through chapter 24, uh, verse 22, we'll see that father-son trope picked up again, like we saw in chapters 1 through 9. And then in chapter uh, 30 and chapter 31, it's two different authors that are introduced. Uh, a guy by the name of Agar wrote chapter 30, and a guy by the name of Lemuel wrote chapter 31. That's that one we know so well about the virtuous woman. And so we're going to go through these, and uh, because they're so diverse, because it's so varied, I can't really uh, uh, dig into 32 verses, unless y'all want to spend the night with me. I don't have nothing in the morning till 9 o'clock, so I'm good, but y'all let me know. Y'all want to pull an all-nighter? All right, well, I'll give you an overview. How about that? I'll give you a summary. Uh, uh, of, of chapter 10. So if you flip over in, on your um, handout, you'll see a table on the back that kind of gives us a kind of easy to follow guide for each of these verses, the subject that they address, and how it contrasts the wise and the foolish. Uh, for those of you who are watching, um, you can get a copy of this lesson by emailing us at info, I-N-F-O, at N-M-Z, Tampa.com. Info at NMZTampa.com. It's on the Olo. It's free. You can get it. You don't have to pay a dime. We just want to share these resources with you so you can have something that you can carry along, hopefully, to help you out throughout life. So I'm just going to um, go through these, and then I'll spend some time on a few of them. But for the most part, I'm just kind of going to give a, a brief statement on each of these verses. Let's look, look at verse 1 uh, of chapter 10. Now, um, I think I've told you all before that you know there are different versions of the Bible. Um, and each version has its own unique flavor to it. Uh, King James is the one most of us, if you grew up in church, you were raised up on King James, right? The these, thous, and thuses. That, that's, that's what we, and if you, if you grew up in a very conservative church like me, you were told that's the only version of, Bible, of scripture that's inspired. Uh, so I read King James just because of my, of my traditional upbringing. Uh, it's, it's poetic, but it's written in Old English, which is not, you know, easily understood um, in today's language. But then, so I, I'll, I'll give you an order of kind of biblical accuracy. They have what they call the word uh, for word uh, equivalent or the textual dynamic, or they have the paraphrased version. So after King James, you got... Uh, versions like the ESV, English Standard Version, or the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Those are very accurate translations, word for word, but they use updated language. So the these and thous are gone, and you and me are, repl are replaced there, but the same um, principle in the verses. Now, if you want to uh, if you want to get even more readable, but this one kind of is not a word for word. It kind of looks at the whole verse and gives like a uh, yeah, thank you. Look, look at, look at Miss Kinsley, she's right with us. Uh, that's the NIV, uh, the New International Version. Uh, that one is written in, in very uh, casual language, but it still has biblical accuracy, but you will see that it's more of a uh, 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 thought translation than a word-for-word -word translation. That makes sense. Now, you want to get even more informal, you can go to something called the New Living Translation. Uh, now, new, now, King James says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. NIV may, something like, may so, say something like, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The New Living Translation will say something like, God loved the world so much that he gave his most precious son that whoever believes on him will not suffer a life of damnation but will have life everlasting. But then you can go to something called the Message Bible. The Message Bible will say, God loves you with all of his heart, so much so that he emptied out the riches of heaven and gave you the most precious and important gift he could, his precious begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes black, white, rich, poor, male, female on him will not die and go to hell, but will live forever in the eternal presence of God. It's, it's, so you see how it kind of, it, okay, so I read all of those, but I read all of those side by side. Um, and so I want to read, I give you an example for the message. Now, King James for verse 1 says, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. In the message, it says, wise son, glad father, stupid son, sad mother. <laughs> so uh, it, it gets straight to the point. And so verse 1 then talks about the two types of children you could have. A wise child will listen to instruction, and when you, know, when you see your child making good decisions, it does something for your heart, right? It, it, it makes you happy. Like you start thinking, and you know how we are, we'll take, we'll take some credit. <laughs> you know, I, I did something right here. They finally listening to me. But then when, we, when they make foolish decisions, then we start using impersonal pronouns. You know, Lord, this child you gave me, I don't know what they're up to. I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. We've got to know that wise or foolish, they're still ours. And, and we can't give up on them. And so this talks about uh, wise children please their parents while foolish children grieve their parents. And really, we've been children. We've been both, haven't we? We've done some wise things and we've done some foolish things. So when we deal with our children, before you get too harsh with them, just think back over your life and remember when you were their age and some of the things you did and then deal with them how you wish your parents had dealt with you. That makes sense? All right, verse two. Um, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. So that subject is about the value, what we value most. And if we're wise, we value righteousness. But if we're foolish, we, we value what? Material wealth, money, possessions, accumulations. You've seen people, uh, they validate themselves by what they own. And that, that's why they got to have the latest everything. I, I ain't talking about nobody, I'm just saying what I'm saying. But you, you know the people who, who, who stand in line all night so they can get the newest iPhone so they can show it off. The, the iPhone 29, even though the only difference is it's a quarter inch bigger than the iPhone 28 and costs a thousand dollars more. I'm finished. Verse three talks about our provisions. Provisions. When you're wise, your provisions are guaranteed by God. Look at verse three. What's it say? The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. What does David say in the 37th Psalm? I was once young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. When you live wisely and righteously, God takes personal responsibility to supply your needs. Not your greeds, but your needs. We may, uh, we may not have filet mignon every night, but you got food to put on your table. Amen? But for the, for the foolish... Their provisions, their accumulations will eventually be destroyed by God. God is, I like how it says in the King James, it's very poetic. It says, he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Here today, gone tomorrow. Y'all remember the dot-com um, 
bubble in, um, in the early 2000s, I believe it is, when all those, when Google and all those companies came out and people were buying stocks and they became millionaires overnight and then it crashed and they were poorer than they were when they started. We've got to make sure that our source is God and God alone. Verse 4 talks about wealth. Verse 4, he becomes poor that deals with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes you rich. Message says sloth makes you poor, diligent brings wealth. You see, some of the, a lot of these principles in, in Proverbs are not necessarily just Christian principles. Anybody can apply this stuff. We see people who ain't, who ain't been in the church and don't care nothing about God who understand some of these principles. If you work hard selling drugs, you'll make money. If you work hard at something, you're going you're gonna to experience some, some level of success. Now, if it's wicked, it won't last. But if it's just, it will be enduring. So make sure that our, um, our work ethic, our work ethic is strong. Listen, just because you saved and just because God promised to take care of you doesn't mean we get to sit back every day and watch the world pass us by and wait for God to drop blessings off at our doorstep. Work, diligent, was always a part of God's plan for our lives. It's not a punishment. It's a responsibility that each of us have. Verse 6, uh, we see rewards is talked about um, on two different occasions. In verse number 6 and in verse, well, I got a one next to that. Y'all see rewards again? Okay, maybe it's just one time. All right, but verse 6 says, uh, what? Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. When you live uprightly, when you try to do right, God blesses you for your effort to live justly. When you try to pe treat people fairly, when you conduct your business with equity and fairness, God blesses that. But when you're deceptive and, and, and sneaky and underhanded, what happens to you according to verse 6? Violence will be what uh, defines your life. Verse 7, your legacy. Verse 7 says, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. There are some names even today, if you mention those names, they still live in infamy. If I were to say the name uh, James Earl Ray, not James Earl Jones, we like him. That's Mufasa. I'm talking about James Earl Ray. Who, who was he? Shot MLK. That name still makes us like, oh, James Earl Ray. Hitler. You ever seen any Hitlers walking around? You ever met a, a, a Robert Hitler? No, because his descendants changed their names. You, met, you ever met any Mansons? Because nobody wants to be affiliated with Charles Manson. People remember, people go remember you, but you determine how. But the name of the righteous, it says, is blessed. There are some people in my life right now, when I think about them, I smile because they live such a righteous life before me that even reflected on them now gives me some sense of joy and pleasure. Verse number eight, how we react to instruction. The wise are receptive, but the foolish are resistant to instruction. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Some people Skulls are thicker than the walls of this church. You can, you can talk to them till you blue in the face and they just won't get it. Let me tell you what you do. Save yourself the heartache and the trouble. Put it in the Lord's hands. Some people don't want to hear wisdom. Some people, uh, foolish folk, will take your good intentions and attack you for it. You ever seen that? You trying to help somebody out. You see them headed in the wrong direction. You're like, hey, bro, hey, 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 sis, let me help you out, baby. This ain't, this is, this is a bad way to take. It's gonna end up in sadness and depression. Who you think you are? You ain't, y'all know me. Just mind your business. All right, you got it. Go ahead. And what ends up happening? Verse, 
verse 9 talks about conduct. Whoever walks uprightly walks surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Message. The Message Bible. Honesty lives confident and carefree, but the shifty are sure to be exposed. Here's what I found out. If you tell the truth, you do not have to have a good memory. But if you're a liar, you, you, be, you, better, you better polish up on your memory. Because you got to remember what lie you told or who and when. And y'all know I've said before, if you're going to lie, make sure you get around some folk that don't know you. Don't, don't lie and I'm in the crowd and I know you because I'm going to call you out. And so, but when you live by honesty, you don't have to see somebody walk up like, oh, Lord, what I told them. I, to, I told, did I say I was going to be sick tomorrow? Or did I say, just tell the truth. Tell the truth. You don't have to remember. Because let me tell you, I don't had enough of getting caught up in my own lies. Any, anybody else? I, I, I've lied. I've lied um, trying to uh, uh, make ways for myself on my job. Uh, because I knew I wanted to be off on a certain day. And so I, w I thought I was pretty good at my lies. You know, if I wanted to be off on Friday, I started coughing on Wednesday. You know. But then on Monday, I forgot I was sick on Friday. And so when they asked me how my weekend was, I'm like, yeah, I went out of town Friday, went to the beach. I thought you were sick. Choose honesty. Walk uprightly and you don't have to worry about what you said yesterday. Uh, verse 10 talks about our character. And when you see that asterisk by honesty, what that, what that means is the verse doesn't state it explicitly, but we can kind of read it into it. Verse 10 says, whoever winks their eye causes sorrow and a prating um, fool shall fall. Um, and a uh, message says an evasive eye is a sign of trouble ahead but an open face-to-face -face meeting results in peace. Check this out. I watched a, um, a documentary about an FBI profiler, and they talked about interviewing criminals and trying to find out if they lying. I like watching that stuff. I, I, I consider myself an uh, 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 amateur forensic scientist. I be trying to read body language and stuff. But one of the easiest ways to tell that somebody's being less than truthful with you is that they won't look, in, look at you in your eyes. Every time they answer, what you, you hiding something. And so, but truth and, and, and dignity and honesty will allow you to look somebody straight in their eyes. Let me tell you something. If you deal with a, a, a liar who can look you straight in your eye and lie to you, you better run. Because that's a pathological liar. Those kind of people have started to believe their own lie. Those people can pass a lie detector test without breaking a sweat. Verse 11. That's the first verse that talks about uh, the value of our speech. It talks about the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Be careful who you listen to. That, 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 that applies to the music you listen to. We always say, it doesn't have an influence on me. Yes, it do. Because music sets the mood, doesn't it? If you come into church, okay, I'm going to date myself. But I wasn't listening to Biggie Smalls Ready to Die Sunday morning on my way to worship service. That's when I was putting on Mississippi Mass, Kirk Franklin. But when I was getting ready to go to the club, I didn't want to hear no Vanessa Bell Armstrong. I want to hear, I want to hear something about Mary, but it was Hail Mary by Tupac. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Come with me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Music puts you in a certain mood, gives you a certain mindset. For those of us who are married, for those of us who are married, for those of us who are married at an intimate time, you ain't trying to hear no um, uh, uh, James Cleveland. All right, I'm moving on before I get in trouble. Verse 12. You want to hear some Anita Baker? Verse 12. Talks about our, 
our heart. Hatred stirs up strife. But watch this, love covers all sin. This is a wonderful verse for relationships. If you harbor hatred, y'all gonna be fighting all the time. You're gonna fight with the smallest little issue, you're gonna fall out. Let somebody burn, burn the bacon. You'll be, you'll be cussing about that bacon three days later. Did you pick up the dry cleaning? No, did you, did you burn the bacon the other day? Yes, you did. <laughs> but when you love somebody, have you noticed how much of their shortcomings and imperfections you can put up with? In fact, when you really love somebody, sometimes their imperfections are cute to you. <laughs> listen, listen. Uh, uh, my wife uh, will not, I ain't talking about coffee, baby. Uh, we got a certain place we keep the car keys, right by the door. I get ready to leave, I look in the basket, ain't no car keys. Y'all, I don't even get mad no more. I just go upstairs, baby, before I can say, oh, I'm sorry, 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 she reaching in the purse, here you go. I kiss on the forehead, I go on about my business. What am I fall out for? What, what really did that, did that set me back too much? When you love somebody, little things don't become big things. Will you, will you talk to me for a moment? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, real love does not keep a record of when it's wronged. Real love does not keep a scorecard to try to see who messed up the most. Real love does not keep a loaded gun on its shoulder, on its holster, to say, oh, the next time we get in an argument, I'm going to remember this so I can tell her. Right, right, right. <laughs> Real love covers a multitude of sin. What's that sound like? Sound like the cross to me. Yeah. On the cross of Calvary was the perfect example of true love because when he died on that cross, he essentially covered a multitude, not he, Jesus, covered a multitude of sin because of his love. Verse, um, verse 13, I got to keep going. Verse number 13, uh, consequences. The consequences uh, in verse 13, in the lips of him that has understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of of understanding. Now, we're not, going, we're not going to go into the literal here, but what I will tell you is when you live foolishly, you don't have to, the, the, the belt or the paddle or the ruler or the comb or the spoon or the racetrack piece or the shoe or the fork or whatever else your mama used to use is not the thing you need to be worried about. Because life will beat you worse than any parent can. I wish I had a witness here. There is a rod, a proverbial rod. We are punished for foolish decisions. Our hearts are broken when we make foolish relationships decisions. Our, 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 our credit is impacted when we make foolish financial decisions. Amen, Roundtree. It's a rod. But listen, here's the thing. I've had my share of stripes on my back from making foolish decisions. But what I need, what I've learned to do is I try to remember the pain of what, what, what how it felt last time. So that when the next, because it's coming back around, now I can make a better decision. But for the wise, what does it say? you find understanding and wisdom. In verse number 14, we talk about knowledge, how the wise and the foolish react to knowledge. Wise people accumulate knowledge. They store it up, they can't learn enough. They always learn. They, they always find a way to learn every day. That ought to be a goal. Learn something new every day. I ain't talking about something big. You ain't got to learn a whole new language, but you can learn a word in a different language. 
L learn, learn something. My next, my next goal, y'all. Y'all hold me, y'all hold me to this. I'm gonna learn how to sew. Not sew, so I want to make stuff. But I like to be able to alter and take up my own stuff. Cause when you my size, they they don't sell stuff that fits you off the rack. So um, tall people, I don't, I don't, I don't sympathize with y'all. Uh, y'all might have y'all own problems, but I got the mic. So I, I'm gonna tell you about mine. We have to spend twice as much on clothes because we have to buy the clothes and then buy to get them or pay to get them uh, tailored. So I'm going to learn how to do it. But learn something. Gain knowledge. But not just in little stuff like that. Gain life knowledge. Read the word of God with the intention that I'm going to learn when I read this word. Not that I'm just going to read because I'm supposed to read. But read with intentionality. Read with expectation. Read expecting to come away with something that you didn't have before you read the word of God. But fools, their mouth is near destruction. Verse number 15. The hope of the wise is in God, but the hope of the foolish are in their finances. The, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. As long as I got money, I don't have a care in the world. That's, what, that's how they feel. And, and, and it's, uh, Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. Not impossible, but it's hard. Because how do you preach salvation to somebody who feels like they're already in heaven on earth? Because they have the wrong perspective about money. But I'm telling you right now, I don't care how much money you got, there are going to be some things you face that money won't get you out of. There are going to be some problems you come across. This thing is just, y'all, pray with me. Pray with me, because this thing getting on my nerves. I want to be wise in how I deal with this. Uh, uh, but even, even in poverty, we can approach poverty in a foolish way. You know, if, if we let poverty dictate who we are, just because you don't have money, you don't have to have a poverty mindset. You know, you don't have to wallow in that. You can say, this is where I am today, but this is not where I'm going to stay. Make sure that your hope is in God. Verse, verse 16 talks about results. Uh, the labor of the righteous leads to life, but the fruit of the wicked is sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Verse number 17 talks about instruction. Um, the, the, he is in the way of life that keeps instruction. But he that refuses reproof is in error. You've got to listen to folk who know more than you. Yeah. Let me tell you what. If you're always the smartest person in the room, either you're delusional or you're in the wrong room. People can teach you. Let them. Stop closing up your ears and, and shutting your eyes to knowledge that's available to you. I, you ever had, um, I, I've, I've tried to help people sometimes, uh, let's say with technology. And I, just, I just can't get this phone to pull up the service. I, 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 I did everything you told me, I can't pull up. Let me see your phone. Let me show you. Hit this. I tried that, it didn't do nothing. It's playing now. I did the same thing you did, it didn't do it. When I, are you gonna let me help you? Or are you gonna just tell me everything you did? Sometimes we got to be quiet and listen so that we can learn. Don't enter into a situation saying, I can't learn this. Uh, Y'all know I did that dancing with the stars thing. And she taught me, I was supposed to be the Chicago step, whatever it's called. And it's like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Y'all, I walked in there. I can't dance. I ain't going to be able to do this. And I was tripping all over myself because I'd already sabotage myself, but walk in with, the, with an open mindset into new situations and believe that you can learn anything if you open your mind to it and become receptive. Uh, verse, verse, yeah, you know what? Paul, put this mic on. I'm, yeah, I'm giving up. No, thank you. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm through. I'm through with that. Um, verse, where am I? Verse 
18, thank y'all. Y'all following along, y'all good students. He that hides hatred with lying lips and he that utters a slander is a fool. These are people who um, smile in your face, but they can't stand you. Th these are people who are nice to you just to get what they want out of you. These are people who treat you based on your station in life. But you knew if you didn't have that title or that position, they wouldn't care nothing about you. And then these are the same people who will flatter you in your face and defame you behind your back. And let me tell you, you hear what it says here. A slanderer is a fool. If, if you go around talking negatively, throwing mud on people's names, that's foolish behavior. Because here's, here's what you do when you throw mud on people's name. You get in your own hands dirty. And you think, you think that people want to hear what you got to say all the time. No, they're looking at you. They look, nobody trusts you. And nobody's telling you anything that's uh, of value because they don't want you going and, 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 and dirtying them up like you're doing everybody else. And let me tell you what else about a slanderer. A slanderer who talks about people all the time negatively, deep down is unhappy with themselves. And they have fallen under the misunderstanding that the worse I can make you look, the better I can feel about myself. But it's foolishness. You don't feel any better about yourself. And, and, because listen, when you are content with who God created you to be, if you are secure in yourself, then you don't have time to talk negatively about people. You want the best for them. Amen? And so watch your tongue. Watch what you're saying. Watch who you're saying it to. And we'll see that later in Proverbs. They got some real good stuff about this talking behind people's back stuff. And we all do it. I think the order, I, Facebook, y'all type amen in. You all know we do. Ain't nobody in the room with you, so y'all ain't going to know. The reality is the, the, the America's favorite sport, pastime, is not baseball or football. America's face, favorite pastime is gossip. Ooh, if you want to get in a conversation with somebody and the conversation got a little dull, just start talking about people. That conversation will heat up real quick. And it becomes a competition of who know the most dirt. And it won't even have to know the person. Walk up to somebody right now and say, y'all heard about that stuff about P. Diddy? Yeah, child, you know, um, you know Cassie was the first one, but he paid her off. Yeah, but you know before that, such as that, Farnsworth Bentley with that. We don't know nothing about nothing. But we'll talk for 30 minutes, negatively. But when you start saying pop stuff positive that people are doing, 30 seconds. Nobody wants to talk about that. Uh, verse number 19. I like this one. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he that refrains his lips is what? Is lies. The more talk, the Message Bible says, the more talk, the less truth. The wise measure their words. Anytime somebody is talking too much, it's a lie in there somewhere. You ever notice when somebody's trying to sell you something, they want to keep talking before you have time to really think about what they said? It's because they're lying to you. And they don't want to give you time to consider how bold-faced they're lying in your face. If you're telling the truth, the truth don't take a whole lot of words. Be somebody who's known for your few words. The more you talk, the more a lie is on the horizon. Verse, verse, verse 20, 21. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for the lack of wisdom. Listen, I love this because when you talk to a wise person, it enriches you, right? When, when you talk to somebody who, who has positive things to say, uplifting and encouraging things, who speaks godly counsel, you leave that person feeling better than when you first talk to them. But when you got somebody who's foolish, it, it, 
It saps your energy. It saps your strength. It saps your joy away from you. And listen, if you're around somebody and every time you leave them, you're more depressed and discouraged than you were when you talked to them, you need to stop talking to that person. Y'all you, you, know what I'm talking about. The person who never has anything good to say. Make sure that you are a fueling station for people. That, that uh, when people leave you, they're filled with wisdom. They're filled with hope. They're filled with strength. They're filled with encouragement. If, uh, uh, and I, I know I know it's a child's, childish saying, but it makes sense. If you don't have nothing good to say, just don't say nothing. Listen, I, you know what I've learned to do as I've gotten older? Is when I'm in a bad mood and people talking, I, especially people close to me that won't take it the wrong way, I say, listen, I don't mean no wrong, but I'm in a bad mood. And so whatever I tell you probably going to be wrong because I'm just not feeling it right now. Give me a few minutes, I'll be okay. Rather than just saying anything that come out of my mouth and, 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 and projecting my negativity and my frustration onto somebody else. Just be quiet. You ain't got to say nothing. And I, I also learned this. Um, my words are valuable. And my time is valuable. So before I comment, I start doing some calculations. What's going to be the result of me saying something about this? Is it going to change the situation? Is it going to help the person? If you got a bad, if you got a waitress who got an attitude at the restaurant, and you, and, and this, and you decide you're going to say, that, well, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you talking to people like this? Is that going to help the situation? Or is that just going to make two mad people? What I've learned to do is, if I can't say something kind and say, can I pray for you? Then I'm just going to keep my comments to myself and pray for that person. Decide if your input is going to be valuable. If not, why put it in? Verse 23, 22, 23. 22. Yeah, I was testing y'all. Tw tw I did 20, didn't I? Oh, I missed it. I'm sorry. Thank you. The tongue of the just is as cho choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. That feeds right into what we just said. There's value in the words of wise people. Then verse 22. The ble I love this. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Here's how to know if it's a true blessing from God, is that it continues to enrich you over time. It continues to develop you. It makes you grateful. But some things we think are a blessing initially, upon further inspection, are really a burden. We call stuff a blessing that ain't, that ain't from God. That car that we got that we really couldn't afford, and now we got payments that got us stressed out every month, just because you took a picture at the dealership next to it with the, with, and I ain't talking about nobody. I don't, I don't be on Facebook. I'm just saying. You at the dealership posing next to the salesman. Look at my new blessing. And don't know how you're going to make the first payment. Stop putting that on God. God is not going to burden you with his blessing. His blessing enriches. It fulfills. It brings contentment. Amen. Some of, these, some of these relationships we got in, we thought they was a blessing from God until them true colors came shining through. You're all right, and you, you changed your song, didn't you? Your, your song used to be overjoy. Now your song is hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Verse number 23. Uh, it is a sport for a fool to do mischief. But a man of understanding understands and has wisdom. Let me read that in the other version. An empty head thinks mischief is fun, but a mindful person relishes wisdom. And, and, and I've had my empty-headed experiences. Let's go get into some trouble. Let, let's go paint the town red. Let's go see what kind of mess we can get ourselves into. And that always leads to painful consequences. Amen. 
hangovers, uh, fights, uh, regrets, remorse. Make sure that you're living in wisdom. Verse 24, the fear of the wicked shall come upon him, but desire of the dream of the righteous shall be granted. In other words, when you're wicked, your worst nightmare will eventually come true. Um, I, I, ain't, I ain't been right in the presence, but I seen movies. I watch movies. And in some, some of them gangster flicks, you know, uh, what's his name, Nico? Ne what's his name in uh, New Jack City? Nino Brown. Nino Brown was living on top of the world, wasn't he? He had all the towers working for him. He had money, he had cars, he had women, he had jewelry, until he didn't. Because eventually, all that stuff it's going to come crashing down, and you're going to have to pay the piper eventually. But if you build your life on a solid foundation of wisdom and righteousness, you don't have to worry about the FBI, the DEA, the CIA, or any other initials coming to get what you got. Because if God gave you to it, can't nobody lay a hand on it. Verse, verse 20. Five, we're almost there. That was the one we talked about earlier. As the whirlwind passes, so the wicked is no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Wisdom gives you storm resilience. You can, you can survive the storm when you live by wisdom. Verse number 26, as wisdom to the teeth, I mean, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. This is somebody that you trust foolishly to do something for you. Let me tell you what you don't do. Don't send money by somebody who's broke, desperate, and unreliable. They're going to cheat you. And when they steal from you, don't complain. That's what they do. Y'all remember Aesop's fable about the horse and the snake? The, the snake said to the horse, hey, I need to get across the river, but I can't swim. Can I get on your back? Horse say, no, if I put you on my back, you're going to bite me. He said, why would I bite you if you're getting me across the river? You're doing something for me. Just get me across the river, and I, and, and I just slither on off and go on about my business. Horse said, oh, no. He says, come on, man. I, I just need to get across. I'll leave you alone. Horse said, all right, get on my back, but don't bite me now. He said, I got you. I got you, bro. We, we brothers now. They get across the river, the snake's sitting there just as calm and peaceful. Soon as they get on solid ground, what happened? <sighs> Bit him. And the horse, as he lay there, uh, seizing from the venom pulsating throughout his body, he looks and utters out, why did you, why did you bite me? He says, because I'm a snake. That's what I do. So why in the world do we think that just because a snake speaks kindly to us, that they ain't going to bite us, although they got a trail of folk they've bit, bitten in the past. Oh, they did it to y'all, but they'll never do that to me. Yes, they will. Be wise. We got to stop letting pride dictate our relationships. What make you think you so good? That your sugar so sweet? That your ice so cold? That, that they going to straighten up? If he or she was a dog before you married them. That ring is not a flea collar. They're going to bring fleas to your house. Unless God has changed them. But you can't do it. You got to let God do what only God can do. I hope y'all get some wisdom from this. Uh, verse number 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs your days but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Now understand, these are not promises. These are proverbs. This is speaking generally. Some wise people die young. Some fools live long. But ultimately, you suffer the consequences either in this life or the next. Verse number 28. Thank y'all. Yeah, y'all help me with that because I'm going between two different papers. So y'all just tell me where we're at. Verse 28. The hope of the righteous is gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. That's results again. When you're righteous, God confirms your hope. Because guess what? When you live righteously and wisely, your hopes are positioned according to the will of God anyway. Right? 
If you're living righteously, then you're not hoping that somebody suffers a painful death because they wronged you. If you live righteously, your hope is that God will touch their heart and change them. The, the, uh, what is that? Psalm 37 again. It says, uh, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that if you can manipulate God by thinking you live in righteously, that he's going to give you whatever you want. What it means is if you live righteously, God will change your heart, that your desire is already what he wants for you. So that's why our, our hope, our prayers are misaligned because they're based on selfish fulfillment instead of glorifying our God. But if our prayers are aligned with the will of God, your prayers will continually be answered. Where we at? 29, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. We've already seen this played out throughout the text. Um, hope leads to joy, but with the wicked, lust leads to sorrow. In verse number 29, the relationship with God, with the wise, it says, the righteous will never be removed. God protects you. God supports you. But the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Listen, we sit there word and, and stressing out about the rich who taking advantage of the poor and, and uh, things they have access to that we don't have access to and injustice and inequity and disproportionality and absolutely we ought to speak up against it and do something as much as we can about it. But you know what I found out? One thing rich people came by? A minute longer on this earth. They're eventually going to have a date with death and death cannot be bribed. If so, Michael Jackson will still be here. If so, Vanderbilt would still be here. If so, Rockefeller would still be here. God has his way of eventually evening out this thing and giving justice to those who trust him. 30. Mm -mm, 31. We're on 31, right? 30? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a similar, similar sentiment. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Yeah, and that's, that's the same sentiment as verse 29. Verse 31, the mouth of the just brings wisdom, but the forward tongue, the forward, that means perverse, the vulgar tongue of the, of the wicked shall be cut out. Watch your language. And verse number 32 talks about our, our, our speech as well. The lips of the righteous know what's acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh perverseness. In other words, wise people know how to speak appropriately. They know what to say, when to say it, and who to say it to. You know, sometimes you can say the right thing to the wrong person. Sometimes you can say the right thing at the wrong time. You know, if somebody just got hit by a car because they ran a red light and they sitting in the car bleeding, even though it's right that they ran, you, if you say, yeah, you know you ran that light, that ain't wise. They need help right at that point. And that's, that's one thing, church folk, let's stop pointing out people's faults and shortcomings when they in a pit suffering because of it. They know they messed up. That's why they're in the pit. What they need right now is not a commentator. They need somebody to help pull them out. Look at you down there in that pit. I told you if you went over there, you were going to fall down. Okay, well, I failed. You was right. Congratulations, you win the prize. Now, can you please drop a rope down here? So the, uh, the principles that are repeated um, in this text are rewards, results, and uh, uh, the value of our speech. They serve to, import, to emphasize their importance in our lives. However, all of the subjects covered are necessary for us to understand in order to apply them to the diversity of experience that we've had, we're going through now, and that lie ahead. The more we embody this, the more we embrace these teachings, the more we adopt them and apply them, what we'll find is for every situation we face in life, God has already given us a solution. He's given us the way that we ought to handle it. 
but you can't use it if you don't have it. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God and watch. You don't even have to ask him, Lord, give me a word for this situation. It'll just come bubbling up to the surface right when you need it. I ought to have a few witnesses here that can testify that I've, you've been at a crossroads. You've been at a point where you could either respond by emotion or you could respond by uh, wisdom. And God, when you allow, allowed him, led you always in the right path. But you've got to get his word embedded deep inside of you. The beauty of Proverbs, uh, as, as we'll see as we continue to go forward, is that it's, it's attainable, it's reachable for all people. It, it got some for all of us in it. And we're going to see as we go on, it talks about how to properly handle our finances, uh, how we ought to conduct ourselves in relationships, uh, in employment relationships. It talks about how we ought to uh, save our money, invest our money. It talks about how we ought to treat people. It talks about marriages and, and personal conduct. It talks about all those things. But we've got to be willing to get what God has provided for us. Bible study is one way, but you've got to engage in your own personal journey of spiritual growth through your own reading of the Word of God. If you want a storm-resistant life, choose wisdom. You won't avoid the storm, but you'll survive it. In fact, you'll thrive as a result of it. Amen? All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Uh, we're going to uh, do our uh, prayer for those who are watching. And then if anybody has notated in, in person any questions or observations that you'd like to share, we'll do that after the live broadcast is ended. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for how relevant and applicable it is in our daily lives. Although it was written thousands of years ago, Lord, the principles that are contained in your word uh, still have value to this day. Lord, help us not to be just readers like a man who looks at himself in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. But let us be meditators and practitioners of your word so that we can truly grow, so that we can truly be better, so that we can develop and mature into uh, the, the Christian men and women that you have purposed us to be. Father, we want to reflect godly values in every area of our lives. So we're asking you for wisdom. We're asking you, oh God, for understanding. We're asking you to help us to overcome our foolish tendencies and rather to rely on the strength of the words that you've given us. We thank you for, for taking the time to reveal these precious and timeless truths to us. And as we leave this place, oh God, help us to be better because of your word. We love you. We thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, God bless you to those of you who are watching. We love you and we'll see you on next Wednesday. All right.